You'll notice from the bio that our panelists are from the world of academia, but yet they're not keeping their head in the books. Instead, they're taking their uh, intellectual knowledge, if you will, and applying it in a very practical way. And so with today's panel, they're going to help us begin to understand what children need to thrive in order in, in their early years, um, in order to make sure they are uh, reading ready and become proficient in that by the time they reach third grade. So without taking up too much time, I'm going to ask Dr. Jacqueline Jenkins to introduce you to our first set of panelists. Thanks, Monique. Hello. Can everyone hear me? I have a loud voice. Probably would need this. Okay, <laughs> I'll try to keep it. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Jacqueline Jenkins. I work at United Way of New York City, and I'm the Vice President of Learning, Research, and Intelligence. And this morning, we have um, I have the distinct pleasure of having a conversation with a group of ladies um, who are brilliant and who I would consider to be academic activists, sort of in the field, taking their knowledge and sort of building the bridge between theory and practice. And so this panel is really about talking about these concrete strategies for creating what is called educational parity. Um, long time ago, when I was in teacher school, the director of my program used to challenge us and say, you know, what is the difference between equality and equity? And we were young and we were like, oh, we, we don't know. And so what we learned in teacher school um, was that equality really is about the um, assumption that you're giving people the same things. And equity is really about paying close attention to make sure that if people have special needs, you're giving them what they need, right? And so um, I left Stanford armed with that knowledge, and I went into urban schools and became a teacher for a long time. And I realized that that was really the work of working in urban schools. And so uh, that's a part of what we're going to talk about today. So let me just do some brief introductions. Um, first, we have with us uh, Dr. Susan Newman, who's at NYU. Um, she's a specialist in early literacy development. Um, and her research and teaching interests include early childhood policy, curriculum, and early reading instruction for children who live in poverty. Um, next to her, we have Dr. Tova Klein. Um, she's uh, joining us from Barnard's College's Toddler Center. Um, she works with the research study team that focuses on children's social and emotional development, as well as parents' influence on their children in the early years. Um, and she's also been an advisor for Sesame Street. Um, we also have Dr. Esther Klein, who joins us from the Department of Education. Um, she has a broad base of experience of working with urban schools and particularly struggling students. So she really has a strong foundation, not only in those core programs to help with literacy, but also expertise in clin clinical models of intervention uh, with young children. Um, so let's start with Tova. I have a sp specific question for you. And um, bear with us, academics love three-part questions, so I'll try to be very <laughs> <laughs> but we've heard time and time again that um, in the early care field, and we've heard it several times this morning, that parents are a child's first teacher. And I often like to sort of get more specific when we talk about urban schools and say, sometimes it's family. Whatever loving caregiver is responsible for the care of that child is their first teacher. Um, so could you tell us, give us a concrete idea of, they're on, I think, I think they're on. Okay. Could you give us a concrete idea of what that early teaching looks like um, from the perspective of a caregiver or parent. Um, and then tell us a little bit about some of the specific challenges that low-income families might face when it comes to that. And then maybe some concrete interventions <laughs> yeah, that would be useful to us. Okay. Okay. So let's start with the first part. Um, you, it was interesting to hear the deputy mayor say the case was closed you know, on pre-K paying for itself because the case is also closed on early relationships. They matter. They matter for almost everything. But it's taken us a long time to get to that place. So what are those early relationships? You know, The baby comes into the world. They are primed for relationships. Newborn babies can't survive on their own. So, you know, they're not those little turtles. I don't know if you saw that New York Times had this wonderful video this week on turtles birthing and going out to sea, and I thought that's not what the human baby is. They are primed into a relationship. They're ready for it, 
and they'll take what is given to them. And when it's responsive and attentive and engaging and meets their needs, then literally you're starting a cycle where the brain is making all kinds of wonderful connections of nurturance and love. Um, but also, we know that in these early years, this is when the brain is developing at a rapid rate that we don't really see again. You see some of it in adolescence, but you really don't see this kind of rapid development that you get from zero to five particularly zero to three, but really zero to five, when they're saying now 90% of the brain's kind of capacity is in place. So there's room for intervention, but it's a much more uphill battle. So that case is closed, meaning that we know how much that back and forth between the parent and the baby, or if it's a grandparent who's loving the baby, every child needs to know they matter. So through that, the, the baby, who then becomes toddler, preschooler, um, develops a sense of self, of I'm okay, I'm safe I, and I'm worthy. I'm, I, I deserve good care, but also they learn to trust others. There are people here to take care of me, and you need that for learning. But if you don't trust yourself and trust that others are going to help you, there's no way you're going to ever decode a letter. I mean, think of how hard it is. Susan almost talked about that. How hard it is to actually figure out letters. It's amazing anybody ever learns to read, really, if you think about it. So it's that early relationship that gives them that sense of self. And that sense of self really does become their drive through life. Curiosity, exploration, the desire to know, oh, I, I want to figure this out. Um, and that, again, is coming through, you know, I always say it's the heart and the brain. Because when you just talk about the brain, it sounds like it's so mechanical. It's not. But we know that all the good things in the human, that baby becoming child, um, reside ultimately in the brain. Um, but unfortunately, the brain is also primed to take what it gets. So if that is negative, if that is um, a really unsafe environment where parents who can't do any better just because they can't are not loving and kind and responsive, but also if their life is filled with violence and aggression, you know, what we now call toxic stress, you know, the field of psychology has said for years, trauma is bad for children. It's bad for adults too, but it's really bad for children. So the brain will take that as well. So we really need to ensure protected good environments, both for the parent and for the child. And then you start this ball rolling where the child then is curious and they want to know and they go out and explore and play. And that's why play is so fundamental to young children. So what's that connection between the parent as early teacher and the relationship? Um, and then play is that the child kind of emerges from that relationship always saying, hey, you're with me, mommy, daddy, you know, I need you. But they start exploring and playing, and that's a very hands-on process. Um, but at the same time, the teaching, um, and the first panel talked about this a bit, is language. You know, for the moment the baby's born, we look at our babies and we say, oh, I love you, and I can't believe you're here, you're so beautiful. And then we show them what's in the world, and we do that through language. So some of it is our reading of their cues and giving, mirroring back to them safety and love, but a lot of that is describing the world, just saying, oh, you're sad, now let, you know, I'm going to pick you up and I'm going to comfort you. So it's through that language that does come every day. I was happy to hear the deputy mayor say that. It comes every day. You know, when we walk with our children <clears throat> or, you know, you're standing at the bus stop, the grocery store, I mean, these are all places that we use language. That's the basis of literacy because the child goes, ooh, that's interesting. What is it? You know, with their hands and stuff. Um, so those are the main pieces. And then I think that whole idea of protecting children that, um, yes, ACS protects them from physical harm, but psychological harm is equally, equally important. Um, you know, when children are growing up in poverty, they're being exposed to violence and lack of safety, and then their parents have to be vigilant. So if you're worrying about where you're going to live, what you're going to eat, the gunshots, it's very difficult to tune in to that back and forth that babies and young children so badly need. So all of those pieces really do go together um, for them. So what are the challenges of low income? I'm remembering the second part. Um, there, I think there's many, but if you put them into categories, one is concrete, right? Um, if you can't afford to have books in your house, you don't have books in your house. If you can't afford to have a newspaper delivered, I'm a family who still has a newspaper every morning, and I have children who read it. Um, because, why? Because that's all, they've seen it, they know it, right? Children learn from watching us, right? You read the cereal box, they read the cereal box. So literacy-rich houses where there's books on shelves or magazines, catalogs are good for kids, right? Um, so really getting books to families, not that they don't want them, they don't, don't always have that luxury, um, you know, using libraries, accessing. So there's the concrete needs, helping people have their basic needs met. Um, and then there's the stress needs. You know, life is very stressful if you're working two or three jobs or you don't have a job or you have to move homes. 
is very hard and pays a huge price on a young child and that parent. So every child needs that loving person who says, well, you matter, you matter. You're the world to me, but the parents need that support too. But if you're really insecure and if, you, if, if it's hard for you to read or reading wasn't a good experience for you, it's gonna be hard to cuddle and read with your child. And children learn to read through those cuddling, warm experiences of being with a book and looking at it. But if you didn't have that in your background, and if you, certainly if you're insecure about your own reading, or maybe you d really don't read very well, then it's our responsibility to help parents know you really do matter. And when you look at pictures and say, oh, look at the bear. Remember we saw the bear at the zoo? We teach them that it can be about the experience and not just that, but we help them feel more confident. And that support has to come from birth. We know that from home visiting programs, another case close, um, that early, early, early support for all parents so that they can feel like they matter and that they're gonna have what they need. Thanks, Tova. Yeah. <laughs> um, Susan, um, researchers have really played a role in helping us to understand that the adult in the child's life should look for certain indicators. Um, early on of a child's healthy development along a continuum. Someone here spoke about that zero to eight span, that it's not just about zero to three, then preschool, then schools, but that there are these key milestones that we should be looking for. Could you sort of help us to understand what some of those indicators are that we should be looking for? And maybe what are some disturbing trends you see um, in certain communities where those milestones aren't being met? Like every good academic, I use slides. Okay. <laughs> so I'm waiting for my slides to come up. Uh, let me see, do I hit? Yeah, there you go, go back. Is good. this the one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So um, I wanted to start today to talk about some of the critical skills I think all of us know that children will likely need um, in order to be successful. What? I see them. I That's see them. The oh, my what? Slide. Oh, it's your slide? Oh, she was like, we have the same slide. slides. Which one is yours? Uh, this one? No. no those are mine. Oh, all this, sorry, they weren't in order. Yeah, yeah. This one? In, that's it. <laughs> but Esther, isn't it fascinating that we're going to say the same thing? First thing, I'd like to say, <laughs> I'd like to say that this is kind of a love fest um, among all of us, because I think that there's so much agreement um, one of the things I'll be talking about are the skills children need in order to be successful. But at the same time, I so agree with what you were saying and say, you know, it's that eye-to-eye -eye contact for the child and the parent and the caregiver very early in life. I often say to parents, put down your cell phone, look at your child, and talk to that child very early on. <clears throat> because we know that rich vocabulary is so critically important. Um, talk is fundamental to what children and parents and caregivers give in the very beginning. Um, but one of the other things I want to caution us about is everybody's talking about the word gap. Um, you hear it on every uh, uh, politician's um, speech at this point. But one of the things we know is that words are conveyor belts of background knowledge. They help children understand how their world works. So it's not just about talk or about the sophisticated words that parents are using. Rather, it's about what the parents are talking about and the quality of those wonderful experiences early on. You know, early this morning, I take my dog for a walk every single morning. And what I find is I talk to her because I'm a talker, right? <laughs> and, and that's what we often do naturally. It's second nature to us. But one of the things we have to recognize is how instructional that is in the very early years, that that will provide the child with background knowledge and concepts and comprehension that that child will desperately need to have in order to begin uh, school successfully. We also know that phonological awareness or the ability to detect and, and uh, differences in sound are so critically important to children 
early on. Uh, one of the things I've noted, even in the city, is I've noticed there's a great attention to alphabetic knowledge, but less attention to phonetic and phonological knowledge. So in other words, our children need to hear the distinctions between words and understand and uh, segment as well as blend words. They do need their alphabetic skills, and in answer to the previous um, a panel, I say I want those alphabets up, but I don't want them 20 different places um, in, in a room. I want them where children can actually access them and use them. And finally, they need print concepts. They need to understand fundamental aspects of what is a word, what is what constitutes a word, when a word begins and ends, left, right, uh, directionality. So, I want to tell you about uh, a little study we did because one of the things that we are interested in is tracking inequality. And I thought your comments initially were so critically important because there's equity and there's inequality. Um, one of the things we tried to do this summer is we tried to understand the summer slide. Why do so many of our children who are in Head Start and early education, why do they do so well? And they're on par by the end of the year, but then they come to school and they're behind again. And so what we began to do is we wanted to track what happens during the summer for our children early on. And what we did is we examined this in three uh, cities across the country. And we actually biked every single street, walked down every single street. And we asked a very simple question. Where can we find a book? Where can we find a book for our children um, who are five years old and below, knowing that these early experiences with print are so critically important? So I want to show you just one of the findings that we uh, found for our low-income children. We found that in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, we are staring at the capital. We are staring at the Washington Monument. Yet we are not staring at books for our children. So we found that there were 830 children for every book we could find Yes. When we looked at whether there were uh, books for our children who are in preschool, we found zero. Zero. So I want to show you what that graph looks like. For middle-income children, this is what we found in our cities. Um, we were looking specifically in Washington, D.C., Detroit, Los Angeles. And the large graph is the, the number of books that we see for middle-income children, those kinds of books that parents could buy and get at various times. For our low-income children, we found, look at this graph. It's a shame. And in the United States, this should not happen any longer. We have access to books. Why are our books not being um, in our community? So one of the things that I would like to just leave you with is we have to recognize that literacy is a community event. It's not just an individualized event. Um, it's something that other people talk about. So one of the powers that we often see in libraries is the social connection that parents make when they are talking about books and hanging out together. Finally, we've started um, an intervention. Um, I know Rebecca Payne is here with um, um, Every Child Ready to Read, but we've been talking um, in libraries. And we say to parents that all of you can do some very simple activities that ensure that children get the phonological skills, the letter name knowledge, all the fuddy-duddy words that you and I use um, in the day-to-day. -day. And we're going to simplify this, and we're going to tell parents it's easy easy for you to do. These are the five essentials you need to do every single day. You need to talk to your children. You need to sing with them because singing you and I know is phonological awareness in a very um, easy pattern to learn. We need you to read every single day to your child to write. And finally, play is how children learn. So even if I told children stop the play, they would do it anyhow.
Um, because that is fundamental to how children get many of these skills early on. Thank you, Susan. Esther, you work in our school system, in the Department of Education as a literacy and academic intervention specialist. Um, so once a child leaves those early care centers, those home-based centers or home, what are some of the indicators from the perspective of a teacher that a child might be struggling um, or unprepared for school? And what are some of the strategies that teachers and specialists might use to course correct early on? And Esther, I think that. Yes. yes. <laughs> slides. So um, I'm, I'm assuming you gave me the one or the both. I, I, I got very distracted with uh, yeah. moving ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start with the first one. Um, so, you know, from a teacher perspective, and, and I, I think it's very good that, that Susan's slides and, and actually what Tova said are also overlapping in what I'm about to say, because to me, it's very, very reassuring uh, if I am not the Lone Ranger uh, on certain <laughs> ideas, because it means that there's some uh, consensus, uh, especially in the research. Um, so when a teacher, uh, and, and by the way, teachers don't always know what to look for. Um, it depends on the teacher, it depends on the experience, the lack of experience, the training. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing is in professional development is also bringing to teachers' attention the kinds of things that they need to look for. Um, because we're assuming the teachers are sort of ready to see all of this, especially uh, with very, very young children, uh, where right now there are a lot of uh, controversial aspects to how much uh, are we going to do academics versus developmentally appropriate practice, the kind of practice that you're both uh, talking about. But in an ideal situation from a teacher's perspective, um, one of the things, the most obvious, and we're all talking, everybody's talking about that, uh, is language just plain old language. Um, so if you're um, invited to somebody's house for a wonderful dinner party and you get you know, seated next to Uncle Harold, um, you'll know like within, you know, I haven't seen him in 30 years, you'll know like in about three minutes uh, what his uh, language abilities are, what his background knowledge is, and how interesting he is going to be as a dinner partner. Um, it, it's not that easy with kids because um, we're not actively testing for that in these very early grades, although we are doing active assessment in other areas. So when you think in terms of what should a teacher look for in language, ideally, they're looking for vocabulary and fund of knowledge. They're not giving a test. It's a very informal view. Um, and a lot of times people forget the fund of knowledge part because that is the vocabulary. It's not necessarily that the child is using, you know, $5 words all the time. It's really everything that they know uh, because that's, um, that's the basis to which new information uh, is attached. Um, I would say for the last 25 years or so, but especially now with Common Core emphasis in, and my world is K, K now pre-K-12, um, we are asking kids to do certain kinds of things. Um, one of them, very, very typical structure, is to talk to each other. They're working in, you know, the teacher teaches for a few minutes, kids break up, they work in pairs, they work in quads, uh, some kind of small groups. They have to do some peer-to-peer -peer work. They definitely have to talk to, you know, when you say turn and talk, and we sometimes do that with adults, um, you know, even as adults, we're not always that proficient uh, in either the talking or the listening part for, for many reasons. Um, not, not even having to do with ability, just uh, sometimes uh, other factors. So kids need to be able to do that. And when you're thinking in terms of pre-K, that is where you're starting to infuse those kinds of structures that are going to become very, very fundamental in the instructional protocol. And then one area that I'm very interested in, and this year I'm going full blast on this uh, across many grades, including this upcoming Saturday to parent training, um, is questioning. So for, you know, I don't know how long, 100, 100 years, we have talked about teacher questions and levels of questions and make sure you raise the qu levels of questions. All good, don't stop. Um, but one of the things we haven't really looked at um, that research has shown that we have to look at is the idea of question generating on the part of children. So teaching children 
self-questioning, stra I'll call them strategies, but you know that's a little misleading. So the, the ability to question, because if you're having an interesting conversation with somebody, uh, it's not just about listening to them, but it's also asking questions about what they are saying, and certainly once you are listening to, uh, to uh, somebody reading to you, or you are reading, good proficient readers do ask questions. Sometimes unconsciously, they're not even aware of it. So language, really big. And honestly, I, it, I could have just gone on and on and on with the, you know, do the wrong thing with the slide, put too many bullets on it. But there are many more. So another one is socialization. Um, you know, one, one of the reasons a lot of kids, uh, and, and there is definitely a race and ethnicity gap uh, related to this, but the over-referral to special education um, has to do with behavior. Um, I mean, certainly we'll look at academics, and that's another reason. Um, when young kids do not learn how to navigate through language, um, things like frustration, trying to get what they need and what they want, um, socialization starts to suffer, um, and really then we start looking at that child as different, meaning a teacher might do that. So we want teachers, and, and good teachers do look at kids' uh, socialization to see where the issues, where they exist, are a function of language versus some other, and that's really tricky to see, but very critical. Um, one of the things, in July 2012, New York State instituted um, a, a, a mandate called Response to Intervention, RTI. Um, and RTI is a K-4 initiative in New York State. In New York City, we take a K-5. Uh, and I'm very interested to see now with the pre-K, uh, that these building, we've always had pre-K classes, but now this really intense building of them, we are gonna have to start looking at the response to intervention, but especially at that stage, it's not intervention, it's really prevention, um, and seeing how, um, uh, how kids are responding to the instruction in the classroom, because that is very telling for a teacher. And by kindergarten through grade four, it's more than telling. It's a, a decision-making um, protocol. And finally, the phonemic awareness. Um, and again, um, you know, in the good old days of early childhood, uh, before there was a lot of pressure on academics, where we jump very very quickly into uh, alphabetics uh, intensely, but word, word level, you know, uh, reading. Um, so in the happy days of early childhood, there was a lot of singing, there was rhyming, there was wordplay. Uh, you, you played little games with people's names and the hello song when you came in. Um, and so phonemic awareness is very critical. And the reason why that happy stuff is so critical is that it allows teachers to see the kids who have difficulty uh, in that area. Um, in my doctoral work, one of the things I looked at was rhyming um, with young kids. And everybody said, like, everybody knows how to rhyme. Like, all kids know how to rhyme. Like, why would you be looking at that? Well, as I'm sure everybody uh, you know, on the side of the stage here uh, knows, no, not everybody knows how to rhyme. Um, uh, even when they're eight, and sometimes not even when they're 21, or you know, that's about the oldest that I, I get to interact with them. Um, so we really have to do a lot of focus, and, and by the way, we are, because part of the, there was a question about the curriculum for the early childhood, and we are not a mandate uh, city, an adoption city, but the early childhood office is looking at the kinds of things um, really that we're talking about, including some of Marilyn Jager Adams' influence uh, on the phonemic awareness work. And there are many people, of course. Um, but that's something that teachers uh, can look at. Uh, so, so those are some of the challenges that people would look at. Should I do the, did you do the second part? I didn't know if you, um, the, the yeah, is that, that might be the next slide. Oh, there it is, okay. so. Do I have time to talk for a minute about that? Okay, so um, so I think the second part of the question was, um, uh, 
it, you know, the, the idea of accelerating literacy learning, and accelerating uh, to me is a, a, a deep, deep wish. It's a desire that we all have. Um, and it makes sense that if somebody is behind, if a student is behind at any age, especially at an early age where you feel that you could really intervene uh, you know before things become critical uh, and there are many dip years uh, you know so second grade at the Chancellor Chancellor Farina uh, e even though the research says third grade is that really critical year you have to be reading by the end of third grade or after that uh, you still get them to read but then you have to spit blood um, so we are focusing on grade two where we really want to start building up so grade three doesn't become the emergency that it often is. But then there are the sixth grade dips, which are very, very correlated to 10th grade, whether you stay in school or drop out. Uh, so there are many dips. But um, acceleration is very easy to say as I'm sitting up here, as we're sitting up here. It is really hard for teachers to do and for families to support. But that being said, um, it's critical that we do it. Um, so for kids who are behind in some way from typically developing peers, um, acceleration is very critical. And a couple of strategies, and I use the Chancellor like, has like this five C's things. I use my three, my critical, crucial, and compulsory. Um, you can interchange them. You know, the homeschool partnership, everybody talks about it. It's almost. Um, like people don't even know what it, what does that really mean, but it is very very critical, um, especially where there's acceler uh, acceleration needs because where there aren't that that partnership already exists very very explicitly. Um, so here's one of the things that we're thinking about in terms of parent training. First of all, um, there was a lull for quite a few years where um, parent training was other people's responsibility, probably organizations that are in the auditorium. Um, but we are taking a very, very active view of parent training. Uh, we're starting with an elementary, middle, high school parents um, events. These are Saturday uh, events. Uh, this Saturday is the first one for elementary parents. Um, and here's the thing about parent trainings. Um, they need to be. Uh, you, as any time that you are uh, speaking to an audience, teaching them something, doing something together, you have to be very mindful of what the audience needs, where they are, what they're able to do, what's realistic. So it's not just getting up and doing a fun, we are going to try to have some fun, absolutely, but um, really trying to figure out where you can move the agenda in the home. Uh, because in high poverty homes, there are many, many factors, and desire to help your child is not one of them. Everybody wants to help their child, but there are stresses. Um, there's a lot of depression, like when people feel that, you know, why aren't you reading to your child? You can take them to the library. That requires a certain amount of oomph, you know, to, uh, and you might have other children in the home that, that are, um, that you have to care for as well. Um, so one of the things we're really focusing on is giving very, very explicit instruction and tools uh, to support the kind of acceleration that we're talking about, because it won't happen just in schools, um, just in the classroom. Um, the strategies have to be very clear, because typically when educators talk, they assume, well, you know what I mean, you know, it's, it's so clear to us. Um, and it really has to be focused on engineering more, more robust use of language in the home. Um, and the other thing that um, is harder to do is really the best training. Uh, and to me, um, this is hard for us to do. But I'm hoping that for, the, for many of the people in the audience that work with parents, um, that you do the training of, where the parent is actually working with their own child and getting feedback, modeling, sort of in situ uh, with their own child. Because typically, that's not what happens. They go someplace else. They get some instructions. And what we all always tell teachers is go back to the classroom and practice and have people sort of give you some corrective feedback. Parents don't have somebody at home giving them the corrective feedback. So they might be doing things not exactly the way it was intended. So the parent training is very critical. We could talk, all of us I'm sure could talk about it for hours. And then progress monitoring, very critical. Because oftentimes, 
before the RTI days, we would let kids sort of linger and fall further behind um, without really knowing, not through any malicious intent. And the big focus right now in that state mandate, the K-4 to mandate, which we extend to all grades, including pre-K, is that we try to monitor appropriately, not too intrusively, and not to test to the point of, you know, where you don't want to come to school. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have time for one more question, or should we open it up? Great. So here's a question that I love to ask academics all the time. If uh, you could say one thing to a policymaker about what they should be doing in these early years, what would it be? <laughs> I have one. Okay. Um, oh, I have a few. Okay. Can I have a few? Yes. <laughs> um, traditionally in our country, um, we have supported monolingualism. Um, we have supported uh, English only strategies where um, many of our children who come from a rich language background other than English come to school and they learn English and they lose their other language. And what is critical to me, what I'd like to see, is we know cognitively, for example, that bilingualism is a plus, is a fundamental characteristic that all of us should have in the United States. If we are going to be global, uh, good global participants and partners in our society, why isn't bilingual education regarded as something we should do in our schools? And this means supporting the existing language, but also building a second language at the same time. So that would be one. Can I have one more? Yes. Oh, just one more. <laughs> All right. Secondly, um, Many of our children are not getting uh, a full day kindergarten program. And believe it or not, in this country, what we are seeing is that children will often come from a rich pre-K experience and then have nothing in kindergarten. Or they'll have a kindergarten program that's two and a half hours long with breakfast and lunch, meaning that they get very little instructional time. This is very difficult for parents. This is very difficult for any kind of vertical alignment for um, instruction. And so that is something I think policymakers, do you realize, I don't know if people realize this in the audience, but only 15 states have mandatory kindergarten in our country. Yeah. So right now, it's very hit or miss. We need to make sure that all of our children get a rich experience. Thanks. Tova? Well, it's such a big question. I'm going to piggyback on that and say that, um, you know, kindergarten is important. we got to start way before. I would like to say to them, this is a marathon, a tremendous marathon. It really starts prenatally. But if we talk about when the child's here, that it's not a sprint. And parents need support, and they need it ongoing. Right? So we have these wonderful programs that don't have the luxury of coordinating. So we need sort of this model of working together around the community, raising the family. And so that would mean starting early to be sure that every parent, income, culture, whatever, high, low, middle, has support. You know, depression is a big issue. It, obviously in poverty, but amongst lots of parents. So that we're giving that support really early on, but we're continuing it, right? We have these wonderful home visiting programs. Some of them are only for first time parents, right? Your second child can really throw you, right? So your life could be different. So this idea of ongoing support. And the other piece I would say is really recognizing you know, we talk about play, it sort of gets us like, yeah, 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 kids, it's getting great media press, it's, the research is out there, but that we really help um, our policymakers see the connection between safety in neighborhoods and homes and psychological safety and the importance of emotions. And that kind of ties this all together because over and over we see this in the data. And I think some of us kind of go, yeah, you know, teachers, researchers, a whole lot of people, which is that it's not IQ that predicts success. It's all these other things, you know, the ability to focus, the ability to have attention, the ability to be persistent, motivated, and that comes out of these early years and relationships. So that's what the children need going into whatever we consider formal school. Yes. So, well, yeah, my list would be really long, but um, 
since we do make some of the policy, I'll leave, I'll leave the ones that we do make out. Um, but um, I, I would say that in my mind, and, and I'm speaking really more as a citizen than as an educator, um, that the idea of capacity building, um, and maybe I am speaking as an educator here, but <laughs> let, let me rephrase that. Um, uh, what's what's happened is that we when when we speak to teachers or when we speak to administrators or when you speak to uh, students in pre-service, we talk about um, everything that we talk about. We used to say it's built on 30 years. Now it must it's got to be about 40, 45 years of research that keeps building, being corroborated, and we kind of know what to do, including the clinical aspects of it. Uh, those would kick in, of course, you know, when, when somebody's in trouble, when a child uh, falls behind. Um, but as I go around, um, so school, many schools have wraparound programs with CBOs, community-based organizations, some of them in the room. Um, the ones that I feel do the most robust work to support the school um, are the ones that really focus on building capacity, whether it's in their volunteers. I, I know there's, I see the JCC people here. A lot of focus on building very specific research-based uh, strategies for volunteers, things that any layperson can learn um, and use as they work with children. Um, and of course, this extends into schools and teachers, because teachers are not always as prepared as they need to be. So to me, the the policy work has to include that, because that piece is usually left either to the local group or to the school system or to the pre-service system. Uh, sometimes none of those three talking sufficiently to each other so that the capacity building is going in the same direction uh, and the people are focused on priority areas. So to me, it's capacity. Thank you. All right, let's open it up for questions from the audience. I'm Deborah Schechter. I work here at Scholastic on some of the FACE initiatives. And I'd like to ask you, Esther, about your comment about the parent training, the, the second bullet point. Um, I get the idea of teachers modeling how to interact with their uh, teachers modeling for parents, how to model with their kids. But could you give some suggestions about practical strategies, a teacher as a classroom of kids, of how she's going to give feedback after watching parents interact with their children, it f sort of feels complicated from a management point of view. Sure, so I wasn't necessarily talking about the teacher being that trainer, uh, although there's no reason why it can't be. Um, so the thing is that, let's say when teachers or schools, and now schools have um, a piece of time set aside to work with parents, call parents, do parent-related uh, work, on Tuesdays, um, I don't necessarily mean that it has to be the teacher. It could be your organization that does it. Uh, but typically, we do a workshop. So for example, here's a fun workshop, how to make books with your children. It's a great workshop, because then you have to fill up the book, and you know that's the whole uh, point of it, ultimately. But rarely is it done with any kind of modeling with real kids. So you're kind of telling people, it's like, um, it's like me telling you a recipe. It's much better if I show it to you, and it's actually even better if I have you do it alongside of me, or I'll give you feedback the second time you try it. Um, so in the, in the trainings that we're doing for parents, we're doing what I call the level one training. They're, the children are in a separate childcare room, uh, so it's not going to be with real kids. Uh, but I'm really reminded of, of people who, who train teachers, for example, using an actual child or group of children uh, to demonstrate. You know, usually when it's school-based, you can do that. Um, so it, it's really um, about establishing those structures. I don't think they exist in any great way, and I'm not putting it only on the teacher. I'm putting it really on, on all of us. Can I just add a little bit on that? I think one of the things I'd like, if there's any teachers here, um, I'd like to say that as a teacher, we've got to stop telling parents things. And I would like to also stop using the word training. Um, I can tell you as a mommy, I don't want to be trained. Um, and I don't want to be told. 
Um, I want experiences that show me what I can do in the day-to-day. -day. I want social messaging that help me understand why is my child squirming uh, when he's being read a story. Well, he's squirming because he's a little guy. <laughs> little guys squirm, right? Um, I want I want some of that wonderful social messaging going on in the normal, informal conversations between teachers and parents. I think parents need that kind of respect and um, should, should, we should engage in more, to, more of those modeling experiences like you were saying, Esther, and less of the um, authority-driven, didactic kinds of conversations. Okay, like that. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is, oh, sorry, my name is Leora McGillner, and I am a pediatrician at Mount Sinai, and I'm also medical director for Reach Ed and Read of New York. And I also have a question for Esther. I've noticed in my own practice an increased number of parents coming in and telling me that their children aren't doing well in school, and the school told them to come talk to their doctor. So my first question is, did you speak with the teacher? Did you request a learning evaluation? And they say, well, that's what you're going to do. So I don't know if this is a policy change or, and, and I was struck by what you said about how a lot of um, the differences that are seen are actually due to socialization or behavior. So I definitely understand that there can be a behavioral piece. And obviously, we think about ADHD and other issues, but first and foremost, I want to make sure that they're being evaluated and there are no learning issues that need to be addressed. So if perhaps you could comment on that, and also I was under the impression that if a parent requests a learning evaluation at the school, they're entitled to get it um, and get an IEP. So I just want to make sure I'm advising people and I don't know if others in the room have had similar experiences. Apparently yes, so. Apparently. <laughs> okay, I'm not alone. So, you're not alone. So, um, so, so that's a great question, really, because um, evaluation should never be the first, um, the first step. I'm guessing, and, and I'm only guessing because, uh, you know, this is not. We do, we do. There is no policy where we say go to your doctor. Uh, to, to figure it out. You know, we have to figure it out. Go to your doctor if there are medical issues. So here's a, sort of a pattern. I don't, I don't have data on me on this, but so for example, in middle class neighborhoods, people do go to the doctor, um, not usually with early childhood, but soon after, because they want a 504, which is a non-IEP driven route to getting extended time, special services, goes all the way up to 21. You renew every year, you talk to your pediatrician, he or she writes you permission for the 504. Um, we would not, ex no one would expect um, a pediatrician to do an educational evaluation, but the big trend, again, with this response to intervention movement across the country, is not to do evaluation first, but to try to take care of the issue um, in the classroom. Because here's what happens when uh, we sort of rush to evaluate. And, and this is like a very fine Solomon's line, like because sometimes kids do have to be uh, evaluated to see is there a learning disability, uh, et cetera. But, um, the thing is that in this country, there is a huge, um, what's called the disproportionality issue. Um, and uh, so let, let's say the learning disabilities gurus, uh, Sally, Dr. Sally and Bennett Shea would say maybe 20% of the population has some kind of uh, dyslexia, let's say. Um, they specifically use that word. Um, the, when you look at special ed across the country, the predominant population in there is minority, African American and Hispanic, a little bit heavier leaning towards boys. Um, so the Shaywitz has never said, like, we're only talking about white people when we have that percentage. They're talking about all people. And uh, so there, there is, in New York City as well, um, a real issue with that disproportionality in terms of referral. So sometimes, rather than refer, because people are starting to become a little bit, not enough, but a little bit more conscious 
of this disproportionality, so they may not rush to evaluate. Because if you rush to evaluate, an IEP might ensue. And honestly, an IEP is something that should only happen if somebody has a true disability. So they might send to the pediatrician to see, you know, what, why is he so squirmy? Um, you know, why doesn't he get along uh, with other kids well? You know, why might, might he or she uh, fight? So actually, evaluation should be, uh, nothing wrong with having a pediatrician make some decisions about, um, you know, hyperactivity, let's say. But really, first, we are encouraging people to, to actually try to resolve the issue uh, in what's called the tier one in the classroom using very specific uh, and good methods and, and seeing if, if that it will just go away, which it will. Go ahead, Tova has some. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that and give a push or a plea. I know teachers and schools are under tremendous pressure. Um, there's no question about that. But we tend to forget one of the most important pieces, that children are individuals. They're individuals first. And their social, what we call their cognitive or thinking, their emotional go together. One is not separate. The squirming behavior, the thinking about themselves, their desire to learn, all are part of a package. And the narrower we define typical or right or good, the more we say, oh, this child, there's something wrong with him. And we really, to go back to the parent piece that you were both talking about, we really do parents a disservice when we say something's wrong with your child. And then I guess the pediatricians you know, they come to you or to us, um, is that children are individuals and they have their own pace and they have their own ways and they have their own wirings. And we have to be very careful in that balance of when does a child need intervention? Certainly some do, no question. When does a parent need support? And when do we have to help parents understand who this child is, what they can do to advocate for them and help the school work with the parent in partnership and not see difference or the sort of you know, on the edge, not down the middle, kids as bad or wrong. But I do understand that schools are under tremendous pressure. I'd like to just add a statistic real quickly. Um, I was a, a assistant secretary for elementary and secondary education. Um, and one of the things that we identified was the percent of children who are special needs. And in the federal guideline a, a while ago, it was 2% which means that we are significantly over-diagnosing many of our children. So that wonderful little squirmy kid is going to be OK. <laughs> and he's not going to have dyslexia um, if we are a little bit patient and we understand child development just a bit better. We have a questions down here, too, in the front. Hi, uh, my name is Rosalind Coates, and I'm from Schenectady, upstate. Um, but house. I want to ask a question of the group, probably Department of Education in particular, about uh, kindergarten entry assessments yeah. and the importance of that to the zero to five group that's trying to work on that as an outcome and then as a beginning to help the teachers understand getting to third grade as a baseline, and then also how to individually work with the children on a multi-domain assessment. Is that a requirement in New York City? How are you implementing it, and do you support it? So for pre-K, to the best of my knowledge, there is no entry uh, assessment. Um, there is, there will probably, and I'm sure this is already in process. There are going to be some. There is going to be some uh, attempt, and ultimately something will be put in place so that we can start to do some of what I mentioned before. In terms, you can't monitor progress if you don't know where uh, you started from. Uh, but the place where there are, and it's not entry uh, anything. It's uh, it, 
the K to four mandate from the state, and this is in many states across the country, uh, does ask that we do a universal screening of every, chi every child in the school, including children with IEPs, uh, just to get a sense of who is at risk. Right now in New York State, it's only looking at reading. They don't even talk about writing, they just say reading. Ultimately, it'll go to literacy, math, behavior, which is the way it is in the rest of the country. Um, so we do have universal screen, screeners that we recommend. We have progress monitors that we recommend. We do provide periodic assessments, always a choice. Um, probably in 20, September 2015, there will be some subsidized options for universal screeners, but those start at kindergarten. Um, they, they're not for the pre-K at this point. Yes, so for kindergarten at K to four and, and up, because a lot of schools pay for these themselves, um, absolutely. So typically you have a universal screener. That is a mandate for K to four. Uh, do all 1,650 schools, 970 some odd elementaries use them? I'm not sure, uh, but uh, technically they do, and we do provide a lot of staff development in different formats for you, just those, universal screening, progress monitoring, and even though it's not in the state regs, I am a fanatic about good diagnostic assessment, so that is always included in the trainings that we do from Central, and, and that does trickle down to the uh, intermediate uh, training uh, mechanisms, uh, networks currently, that is the network system. One more question. Hello, my name is Christy. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I'm an educator as well as a parent. And I basically wanted to piggyback off what you were discussing earlier in regards to um, the overdiagnosis of children in the earlier ages and having them diagnosed and then later on referring that they need an IEP. I honestly think that they need to they need to implement on a policy level more training for teachers on cultural diversity because I think that is the key component. I find that most teachers are overdiagnosing these kids because they're not aware of their cultural differences. So I think if we had more of that going on in educator programs, that we would have less children getting diagnosed and being referred and then later on finding out this child really didn't have an issue they just needed more time, so. Could I add to that a little bit? Um, I totally agree with you. Um, there are lots of cultural variations and there's a lot of variation. One of the things I talked about before was phonological awareness and alphabet skills and some of those things. One of the things you'll find if you ever diagnosed um, young children is there's tremendous variation in this early years because they're sort of getting it all together, right? Um, they have all these different kinds of skills. So one of the problems is that if you look at something real carefully, and I do have to say I'm very hesitant about kindergarten screeners because I think if you just talk to kids, you know a whole lot. Um, uh, I think one of the problems with overdiagnosis is that we are likely to have children begin to develop a sense of, I am not a good learner. I am not good at this. It goes back to what you were saying before. One of the things that we are trying so hard to do at the, the pre-K years is embrace all of our children and to recognize that they have many different learning styles and patterns. And if we over-diagnose them, we're saying that one size fits all for all of our children. And that is just wrong. And I'll just add a tiny bit to that because I couldn't agree more and that that variability is tremendous in younger children. And that if we really pull back and say that development takes time, but another, I think, misnomer that we have, and I always say this to the college students when I'm teaching them, is that um, development doesn't take place in nice little steps, one step, one step. But it's a very complex process, and it tends to be in leaps and bounds. And you know this particularly, well, if you teach, but certainly if you're a parent, that there's often lots of, you know, 
it's what looks like wild behavior, you don't understand, and all of a sudden they make a huge leap, particularly with language or reading or something. So we have to appreciate that it's very complex, and sometimes we have to wait longer than we want to as a parent, teacher, or, you know, or mental health person. Could I just, yeah. um, just want to add something to that. So, so I do agree. I, I absolutely agree. Um, but the state mandate says you should screen, you should do periodic, periodic assessments. So, I don't want to sound like a bureaucrat. Uh, that would be a, that's definitely a, would be a horrible thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. um, but he, here's the thing that um, I, I do believe very strongly is that for some kids, and this is not about identifying disability. This is just about identifying things that can be uh, addressed in a classroom. That um, the whole idea of RTI, for example is that in the past, there was a sort of wait to fail model. And we did wait exactly for the good reasons that you're mentioning, because you do have to give kids, there is variability in kids. Then there, so it's this very fine line between how long, because sometimes we say, oh, he's a boy, he's six years old, um, he's just picking this up slowly, when in fact, you could probably address it. And I'm not talking about heavy academics, I'm talking about sort of some of these precursors that we're talking about. Uh, to good literacy development. So I feel that a screener is not a bad thing because when you are running a school, you might have 1,500 kids or 200 kids. You have a lot of kids that you have to focus on. And you do have to see, in some ways, the kids, you have to pay attention to every kid, but you need to know the kids that have a little red flag. And you could decide, many programs like Reading Recovery, Reading Rescue, they say, you know what, a little young, um, let's give them another six months, even a year, and then we'll address it. But we know we have to watch this child like a hawk. So I think that's very critical. I do want to just uh, say one thing to reiterate what uh, the pediatrician um, uh, there said, that parent referral trumps everything. If a parent wants a referral, there is no question. When teachers and schools want to do a referral, we want to know what they've done first. Uh, to help the situation because we don't want people to say, well, this is a disability as opposed to sometimes what a friend of mine calls an issue of dystautia, you know, like just not taught right um, or at all, dystautia, a terrible disease that <laughs> strikes many children. Um, so so it, it's this fine line between um, exactly what you're saying, which early childhood people do and should say, and then this other thing where I, I don't want to let this go too far. Can I just add, uh, I, I totally agree. There are instances where there's language delays that you know we need to give more intensive instruction. But one of the things I, I'd love to just leave you with is you know children act squirmy if, if they're bored. Um, and much of our curriculum it has become too basic in nature and not really engaging children's minds in the way in which they play and learn and love. Um, so one of the things that I think is really critical is that we really engage them in content-rich instruction that uh, really opens their minds and gives them a love of learning. And I think a lot of that variation and a lot of that skill deprivation may go away when they are really interested in something and want to learn. All right. Um, Esther, Tova, Susan, thank you so much for your expertise and wisdom. And audience, thank you for participating.